Hello, welcome to the Final Round Podcast. I'm Matthew Holt, joined today by Brandon Trochi. As look, Stefan Bonner in New York, Madison Square Garden this weekend, uh, cornering one of his fighters there, taking on Chris Camozzi. So good luck to Bonner, good luck to your fighters at MSG this weekend. We are pulling for you, but we still have cards to break down. The betters need to make some money, and we're here to help you do that this weekend, starting with Bellator 189 from the Windstar Casino in Thacker, Oklahoma, where look, uh, Stefan Bonner's former trainer, Nick Blumgren, here training Chitty, Bang Bang, and Juquani in this card. And we're gonna break this one, but let's start with the women's featherweight title, Julia Budd, Arlene Blenquow rematch here. Look, Julia Budd, only two losses of her career. Ronda Rousey, current uh, Bantamweight champion Amanda Nunez. This is someone who's really earned her stripes here in MMA. Minus 420 favorite against Blenkow, but a rematch of a fight that was close. And Brandon, what do you think? When you have a fight that's close and a rematch, and one the winner of the first fight's this big of a favorite, is there any value maybe in the underdog here? Well, one of the key factors in that fight was Blenkow had an injury and drained her leg for the first contest. So that's going to be interesting to see how she bounced back. It went to a decision, I believe, last time. So it'll be an interesting contest for sure. Yeah, and I thought it was interesting that Blenkow said, look, the knee injury did not affect me in the first fight, but of course, how can it not affect you as any athlete? Anytime you have an injury that serious, your mobility's hampered, everything's hampered. Look, I don't want to bet this fight personally because I love Julia Budd. I think she's the best featherweight, maybe the best female fighter, period, in all of Bellator right now. Uh, but at minus 420, when these two already fought to such a close finish the first time, I'm probably gonna leave this one alone. I looked at the round prop, four and a half rounds with the over minus 150. Again, I, I just didn't, wasn't quite sure either one of these women could get the finish here. I think I'm gonna pass here on the main event. Fair enough. But let's talk about the co-main here. Chris Honeycutt, former the golden boy of Bellator at one point uh, before his lone loss, taking on undefeated local Oklahoma native Rafael Lovato Jr. Honeycutt opened around a two to one favorite up to minus 250. And I think I like the favorite in this fight. Look, Rafael Lovato Jr. is gonna have something going for him here that I always think is important in fights. That's the home crowd advantage, which tends to sway judges at times, especially in these venues like Oklahoma, where he's obviously gonna have friends, family, fans of his in town. The problem I have is Chris Honeycutt is a beast. This was an all-American, really special wrestler who happened to walk into a guy who he couldn't beat and put Paul Bradley. They fought once, it was a no decision. They fought again, Paul Bradley knocked him out in the first round. But I love the way Honeycutt has rebounded since that Bradley loss. Four straight wins in Bellator, stepping up his competition every time. This is probably another small step up. But Rafael Lovato Jr., 34 years old, never fought anybody prime time. The only thing I like about Rafael Lovato Jr. here is he's already fought twice in 2017, so you gotta like the fact that he's trying to make up for lost time by fighting frequently, but I think it's a little too much too soon for Rafael Lovato Jr. Well, Lovato here comes in as a lengthier fighter in the contest, which will be definitely interesting. Comes in with a Brazilian background, so he's going up against a wrestler. Like you mentioned earlier, wrestling tends to uh, overshadow a lot of Brazilian jiu-jitsu fighters, as you know, as we look back in UFC history and Bellator history uh, alike. So it'll definitely be interesting as Honey cuts the favorite in this one. Great bout. Um, like you also said, Lovato is fighting in front of his home crowd. So it's going to be interesting to see what kind of you know matchup this brings uh, into Oklahoma with him being the home favorite, uh, you know, as the crowd's concerned. I actually like this fight to go over the total here. One and a half rounds over minus 130. And this feels like a fight to me that's probably going to get into the second, third round. Look, Chris Honeycutt is not a knockout machine, despite the fact that he's coming off a knockout win in his last fight. His last three fights before that were all decision wins for Rick, for Chris Honeycutt, which makes me think that, look, he's going to use that wrestling base. He's going to get Rafael Lovato down, probably. The problem for Chris Honeycutt is going to be Rafael Lovato is really comfortable on the ground this is a Brazilian jiu-jitsu specialist I'm not sure who wins this fight I tend to lean toward Chris Honeycutt he's the harder puncher the bigger kicker he's gonna probably be able to get takedowns on the Brazilian jiu-jitsu and to your point wrestling always been the kryptonite 
to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu guys. I could see Honeycutt getting top position, using some ground and pound, maybe getting a late second round or third round finish, but I certainly see this one going around and a half. I'm willing to lay the 130. I'm gonna bet this one over the total. Uh, going to our third fight, we mentioned this right out of the gate. Chidi, Bang Bang, and Juquani, minus 160. Again, Hisaki, Kato, don't blink in this one. This is gonna be a great fight. Two big, powerful strikers here. Uh, you know, I got a chance to talk to Nick Blomgren, and he said Chitty's on weight, no problems with weight issues in this fight, moving up in weight. You know, Chitty at six foot three had a lot of problems making 170 pounds, as you would expect any six foot three guy to have trouble making 170. Shoot, I wish I could make 210, and I'm barely six feet tall. But on that case, Look, I think it's one of those things where the move up in weight's probably gonna help him. He's still gonna be the bigger guy moving up to 185 here. And I like Chitty Bang Bang and Juquani a lot at minus 160 in this fight. He's coming off his first loss, which ended a nine fight unbeaten streak for Chitty Bang Bang here. And look what happened in that fight. Andre Koreshkov was able to ground Chitty and Juquani and pound him out. And Chitty and Juquani with that long lanky frame doesn't like to fight on the ground. Uh, and, and it showed in his last fight, but here he's gonna fight a guy who's only a striker, who both of his losses, Hasaki Kato, come by knockout against Strider, including a knockout loss to Melvin Mann, who I think Chidi Njiguani is gonna be the faster guy, the bigger guy, the stronger guy. I think his kicks are gonna be devastating, and I think he's gonna land one of those big kicks, knock out Hasaki Kato, and I have no problem laying the $1.60. I think I'll take your bet on that one. Not too, uh, you know, informed on both of these fighters. You know, with Kikato being basically the underdog here, you know, definitely looking for the favorite Chitty. We'll see what happens uh, come this weekend. Uh, last fight, rounding out this card in the televised portion, Adam Piccolotti, David Rickles. David Rickles has been a staple in the Bellator for a long time. Adam Piccolotti, kind of the newcomer, coming off his first career loss. And I think this is where you find out about a fighter and what their career is gonna be like when a young fighter finally loses that first fight. The undefeated streak's over. How do you rebound from that? Because in MMA, there's very few undefeated fighters. Guys lose, you're fighting with little gloves. It only takes one shot, one kick, one slip up for someone to put you in a choke. How do these guys respond to it? We've seen guys lose that first fight and go into a tailspin. We've seen these guys lose that first fight and be able to go on to illustrious careers. I feel like the line's about right in this one. I feel like the total's about right. We're, yeah, this one's 50-50 to go the distance. Neither one of these guys devastating punchers. David Rickles has been knocked out a few times, but they've been by devastating punchers like Pitbull, like Michael Chandler. Adam Piccolotti is not Michael Chandler yet. Uh, I don't want to lay the big favorite because I don't know how he's going to respond to the loss. Probably going to pass on this one. One interesting fact I found about Rickles is out of his 18 uh, victories, six were TKO, six were submission, and six were decisions. So although there's not a prop on this one per se, I just find him a very versatile fighter. I'll probably get to take him to beat the Adam here. We'll see how it goes on the weekend, but definitely my favorite in this bout would be Rickles. Look, and, and the good thing about Rickles here is you get a guy who's local to Oklahoma. You know, he's from Kansas City, so he's kind of local to the region at least. He's probably gonna have some fans there. He's fought in main events of Bellator before, so he's been through the experience. You're not gonna have any nerves issues. Um, I'm with you, gun to head. I would probably take Rickles too, actually, in this fight. That's it for Bellator 189. And look, now we're gonna look ahead to the huge UFC 218 pay-per-view, and this is a monster card this weekend. Uh, you know, this is a MMA fan's delight, great main card, one of the better main cards we've seen. Although the prelims, you know, don't necessarily feel pay-per-view worthy. This is a great UFC pay-per-view main card. Starting at the top, UFC featherweight champion Max Holloway defending his belt uh, in a rematch against former champion Jose Aldo. The line minus 290, open 320, down to minus 290. Who do you like in this one, Brandon? Um, so Holloway, you know, hasn't lost since 2013 till McGregor, which was a decision. So he's on a wreck, wreaking havoc within the division. As you know, first bout, he took, you know, advantage of the length of that decision and, you know, or, or knocked out, although in a decisive victory. But as you progress during the fight, you saw him really shine as the clear-cut favorite. I think that's why the oddmakers have put him, you know, as a, you know, minus 290 in this contest. So. 
it should be interesting. I would actually see some value in Aldo in this fight, however. But I gotta give it, you know, if, if again, get or head to uh, head to Holloway for the you know second victory of his career over Aldo and clearing out this division. I think that's what's gonna happen here. Yeah, one of the things I think that's interesting in, in MMA compared to other sports is. You know, if you took two football teams and said, hey, they just played last week and the line was even, regardless of who wins the game, if they play again next week, the line's probably not going to skyrocket to one team, to the team that won. Because you're going to assume, hey, the line was even last week for a reason. That's the case here. We get a fight that was essentially a pickup. And look, I love Max Holloway. He's one of my favorite fighters in the UFC. And his 11 fight win streak is unbelievably impressive, to your point. Last loss way back to Conor McGregor uh, almost five years ago. And now has won 11 straight, completely cleaning out the division. The problem is from 2006, from like November of 2006 all the way to December of 2015, Jose Aldo was undefeated. That's almost a decade. 18 fight win streak almost a decade between losses and look you can make the case that in that time from 2006 to 2015 when McGregor knocked him out in 13 seconds that the only case you could make that anyone pound for pound was better than Jose Aldo would be Demetrius Johnson or John Bones Jones so this guy was one of if not the best fighter in the world for almost a decade he gets knocked out in 13 seconds by McGregor comes back and dominates Frankie Edgar again, and then gets knocked out by Max Holloway. We've seen it with Henan Burrell. We saw it with Chuck Liddell at the end of his career. It wasn't age. They just, they didn't have it anymore at that elite level. I don't know how motivated Jose Aldo is. You know, I don't know if he still has it anymore. Is he on that downslide? I know that I have one of the best fighters ever for a decade. And were those losses kind of fluky? Because let's face it, just watch the first round of Jose Aldo versus Max Holloway in the last fight. Jose Aldo was the guy getting the better of Max Holloway. It looked like he started to fatigue in the second as the fight went on and then Max Holloway was able to take advantage. But I certainly don't want to lay this price with the favorite here. The only way I'm betting this is if I'm betting on Aldo. I really don't want to bet on Aldo here. I'm going to take a shot with the under. Both of these guys punch hard, kick hard, are good on the ground, are good in submissions, and go for finishes. So I'm going to go ahead and lay under two and a half rounds at plus 140. That way, if Aldo's not motivated and Holloway comes out and wrecks him early, you get the plus money, and Jose Aldo is as live as any fighter on the planet to knock out, to knock anyone out as well. I'm going to go under two and a half, take the plus 140. Should be an interesting main event, that's for sure. Let's go to the co-main. Francis Naganu taking on Alistair Overeem opened up minus 190. Uh, Naganu all the way up to minus 250 now. And look, I, I don't really understand this line. For a couple of weeks, I planned on making a bet on Alistair Overeem. This is a guy who fought former UFC champion Andre Arlovsky, beat him. Former UFC champion Frank Mir, beat him. Former UFC champion Fabricio Verdum, beat him in his last fight. Former UFC ch heavyweight champion Brock Lesnar, beat him. This guy's list of former UFC heavyweight champions he's beat is unbelievable. His only loss in the last six fights to current UFC heavyweight champion Stipe Miocic. Alistair Overeem has been as good as any heavyweight besides Stipe Miocic for the last five years. But what we look at all of a sudden is this wrecking machine, Francis Naganu comes in. Uh, nine out of his 10 wins by finish, 10 and one record, five and zero oh in the UFC, three of those five wins by first round stoppage. And everyone thinks this is gonna be the next great heavyweight in the world, but Alistair Overeem is the one with the experience, the one who's fought and beat elite level competition. The best guy we've ever seen Francis Nagano win was Andre Arlovsky. Does Naganu have the experience and the talent to put away Alistair Overeem, or is this going to be another one of those, you know, super athletes on the rise running into a really experienced guy here? To be honest with you, I Naganu with the four submission victories and his 10 and one record, I'm really surprised he's the favorite in this bout. Um, I was actually going to ask you, you know, who, why, why is it that you believe that Overeem is the underdog in this? So I was going to make a bet on Overeem, and then I watched 
the four minute live media workout by Francis Ngannou. And I've heard Joe Rogan talk about Francis Ngannou is the hardest puncher in the UFC right now, pound for pound, that they actually registered that, him punching a bag, where they're able to measure the uh, punching power per square inch. And Francis Ngannou hits harder than any other heavyweight in the UFC right now. And I was gonna bet over him, over him anyway, because the experience, the talent, you know what you're getting. Francis Ngannou's still a bit of an unknown here. I mean, his resume, Anthony Freight Train, Hamilton, some of the guys he's beat are complete nobodies anyway. Uh, Andre Arlovsky, way past his prime when he fought Ngannou. Then I watched that open media workout and went, oh my God, this guy is a beast. And I don't want to bet on Alistair over him anymore. And I'm no longer betting the fight. What I am going to bet is the under on this fight at two, because at one and a half rounds, if Nagano is the wrecking machine that he has been, three straight first round finishes, this one's going to end early anyway. Overeem has a history of getting hit and going down, so if Nagano is the real deal, this one ends quick. And if Nagano's not the real deal, Alistair Overeem has the talent and ability to put his lights out kicks, punches, or submissions really early. I think we're this one's going to end quick. Don't blink. I'm taking the under one and a half rounds, minus 120. I think I'm going to lay off this one. Overeem's got to, you know, definitely prove that he's still in the contender for the heavyweight division. Uh, I think he certainly can. We'll see. It'll be a great fight. Look, this next fight here, Sergio Pettis, Henry Cejudo, number one contender in the flyweight division on the line. Henry Cejudo, open minus 200, up to minus 285 and I love the underdog in this fight. And Stefan and I talk about this all the time and maybe it's something you can comment on, is really young guys making that big jump in their MMA careers. And let's face it, Anthony Pettis started fighting in the UFC, not professionally in MMA, which he did at 18. He was fighting in the UFC against guys like Alex Caceres at 20 years old. There were some ups and downs early for Sergio Pettis at 20, but now at 24, as Stefan and I always talk about, fighters make that big jump. You get elite level experience under your belt. You've done that walk under the big bright lights and the big arenas with the screaming fan. The nerves go away. And now what we've seen is a much improved Sergio Pettis on a four fight win streak, including a dominating, ultra impressive win over Brandon Bam Bam Moreno in Brandon's hometown of Mexico City, Mexico. And what made that fight even more impressive is Moreno, who's a uh, ultimate submission artist got got him down in the first round, had Pettis' back and was trying to rear naked choke the entire first round. Pettis was able to fend it off and then completely dominated the fight from there. I love everything I'm seeing from Sergio Pettis right now. Henry Cejudo already lost to Demetrius Johnson, lost to Joseph Benavides, had a couple of split decisions uh, against, you know, Juicier De Silva was a split decision win form. I like Henry Cejudo. He definitely deserves to be a top five fighter, but so did Joseph Benavides, and he couldn't make that next step. What I feel here is Sergio Pettis is the next great flyweight that we're going to see, and I think he gets the job done here because I think he has improved so much at 24 years old. We're about to see a star, and you can get him at two and a half to one. I love Sergio Pettis, plus 250. Sergio Pettis is definitely a live dog in this fight. Uh, Cejudo, you know, he's got a bouncing around record. I think he shows up tonight, or, or this, this weekend, and really puts out uh, a wrestling performance. I think he tries to take him down, but we'll have to see, you know, like like, like uh, Matt just you described, so, uh, Pettis is basically the underdog by a huge value. I think that's the best bet in this fight. Um, Again, very interesting to see how he can defend against the wrestling that Cejudo brings in this fight. And what happens if Cejudo can't take him down? Because as we saw, after that first round against Brandon Bam Bam Moreno, and that went five rounds, Moreno, who's a takedown specialist, never got another takedown again. And look, there's something to be said for guys that grow up in the gym. Anthony, uh, I mean, uh, Sergio Pettis' brother, Anthony Showtime Pettis, former UFC lightweight champion. Sergio grew up in the gym wanting to be his older brother. He's been training at Rufus Sports since he was 15, 16 years old. This kid is really going to make some big jumps here. I expect a big time performance from Sergio Pettis. It's my favorite big underdog of the weekend. Uh, moving down the card, look the tough 26 coaches go at it here. Uh, former Bellator and UFC lightweight champion of the world, Eddie Alvarez takes on former undefeated 
World Series of Fighting lightweight champion of the world, Justin Gaethy. Both of these guys love to bang. They both love to throw leather, and they're both really hittable. Don't blink on this one. Who do you got in what should be the biggest fireworks fight of the night? Uh, I don't know how much Al fight Alvarez has in him. I know he's the underground king. He puts up, you know, he always comes to brawl. You know, that's what he's looking to do. He's not looking to really, you know, trick you, trick you up with what he's coming out with. He's looking to get in your face, grind you out, and really just show he's the tougher opponent. So it's going to be interesting to see how he matches up. Uh, against the undefeated streak here, and is this a live contender for the division? So look, I like Justin Gaethje like everybody else. I liked Arturo Thunder Gotti too, but Gotti couldn't beat the best in the world. He lost to Mayweather, he lost to Ivan Robinson twice, he lost to Mickey Ward, but boy, they were all fun to watch, and that's how I feel about Justin Gaethje here. Look, he's undefeated still, but in his first fight again in the UFC against Michael Johnson, Michael Johnson almost knocked him out in the first round, and that seems to happen in every single Justin Gaethje fight. Oh, Gaethje's in trouble, and he comes back with a big left hook, and <coughs> Excuse me, I mean, that tends to be the case. He has to come from behind, and this will be the toughest opponent of his career. And what I like about Eddie Alvarez is he actually does have strategic, at least strategy for these fights. He knew he couldn't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Anthony Showtime Pettis, so he used a more grappling clinch game, kept him against the fence, got a win there. That got him a title shot against Rafael Dos Anjos. He went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Rafael Dos Anjos took his best punches, was in trouble, and was able to knock out Rafael Dos Anjos, something that really nobody else does in the UFC. I think Eddie Alvarez is a little underrated here. He looked terrible against Conor McGregor. Conor McGregor absolutely shellacked him, and since then everyone has completely written him off. His last fight was a no contest against Dustin Poirier, but if they don't stop that fight for that knee when Poirier was down, I think Eddie Alvarez is gonna finish him in that second round anyway. I actually think Eddie Alvarez is, should be the favorite here and is a really live underdog, and I think he's the right, and look, don't get me wrong, he could very well get knocked out, because this thing is likely to end up being a slugfest. Justin Gaethje is really good at pulling everyone into slugfest. He gets you mad, he makes you want to punch him, and then he takes your punches, which makes you want to punch him more, uh, and turns it into the slugfest you want. So this one could turn into that, and he could catch Eddie, and Eddie's been stopped before. But I'm going to take the veteran with all the experience who really hasn't faded that much. He should have just beat a top five lightweight in, in Dustin Poirier in his last fight. And Justin Gaethje should have got knocked out by like a fringe top 15 lightweight in Michael Johnson. I think you're right. If he doesn't take the bait and Alvarez sticks to a game plan in this bout, there's definitely value in the line here. Um, I would have to go with Alvarez as well in the long run if it is a grinder because he's a test proven. Um, although this undefeated streak really scares me, I think I'm gonna lay off the bet, but I do see value in Alvarez. And maybe even a little value in the under on this fight. At plus 130 on the under in a fight where you know you're gonna see fireworks, I certainly wouldn't wanna lay the 160 over here with two guys that are gonna fire down who both have suspect chins. I think there's value in the under. I'm certainly playing Eddie Alvarez, but if you're looking for a total play, I'd get the plus money on the under here too. Um, Michelle Waterson versus Tisha Torres. Tisha Torres opening $1.85 favorite up to around minus 200 right now against the karate hottie Michelle Waterson. Uh, and what do both of these women have in common? They both lost to current UFC strawweight champion Rose Thug Namajumas. And besides that, they've both been pretty much perfect in their UFC careers. Besides losing to Rose, a lot of love for Tisha Torres here from the betters. Who do you like here? I like Torres. She looks like she's the overall better fighter. Uh, but again, you got number five, got number six. Should be an interesting card. Anything can happen. Uh, you know, these women are both looking to bang. We'll see what happens. Some of the smartest betters I know actually are on Tisha Torres here. Uh, I'm going to stay away from this fight personally. Maybe if you put a gun to my head, I would lean Torres. But here's what makes me nervous about laying the big price with Tisha Torres. This fight's gonna go to the ground. Tasha Torres is going to take her down. And Michelle Waterson is a submission specialist. She submitted Paige Van Zandt. A lot of her wins come by submission. And, and Tisha Torres, I think eight of her nine wins come by decision. So basically all of her wins are by decision. If you go the whole distance in a fight with Michelle Watterson and are constantly on the ground with her, that just continues to open up more opportunities for submissions. More opportunities for submissions. 
And for me, that makes me nervous that all this time on the ground, maybe some fatigue sets in, all of a sudden, boom, you know, Michelle Waterson slaps on an arm bar and this thing's over. I, I, I do agree that the favorite here is really strong. She's incredibly ripped for this fight, in amazing shape. Tisha Torres is a, is a machine. She, there's a very good chance she puts Michelle Waterson through the grinder, keeps her down, pounds her for three rounds. But there's also a chance that Michelle Waterson catches her on one of those scrambles and slaps her in a submission. And I, I just, I'm not in love with Torres as much as everyone else. I'm going to pass. I like it. It's a good card. I can't wait to get these things started. Look, the undercard, uh, you know, we're not going to run through the whole undercard, but a couple of great fights. I don't know if there's any you wanted to talk about. One of them that I looked at was Charles Oliveira versus Paul Felder. Paul Felder, a really about a dollar fifty favorite. Charles Oliveira is one of those guys that you bet on constantly because you recognize the name. I think he's had like 18 fights in the UFC. He's been in there with everyone. You're used to seeing him. A lot of times you bet a guy because you've seen him look good in the past. But Oliveira's been really more on a down streak than an up streak. He did win his last fight against Will Brooks. I think if this turns into a striking match, Paul Felder wins. If it goes to the ground, Oliveira could probably submit him. But I actually think Felder is going to do a good job of of kind of what Anthony Pettis was doing to Charles Oliveira early. Use some distance, throw the kicks. The same thing Edson Barbosa did to him. I'm going to go ahead and uh, lay the, the small favorite here with Paul Felder against Charles Oliveira. Any other undercards you're looking at? Not too much there for me on the undercard. Uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of heavy action on the main card, so I'm, that's what I'm looking forward to mainly. But definitely, you know, definitely see some young talent. Uh, within the undercard this weekend as well. Well, I, one other fight I think I might touch here, Felice Herrig, Courtney Casey. Felice Herrig opened a favorite here. This is a fighter who basically had got leveled to journeyman status in the UFC. Then all of a sudden she beat Alexa Grasso when Grasso was the undefeated Mexican women's star. Uh, Felice Herrig beat her. She won another fight since. She's kind of on a good roll. I've seen her train. She's good but not great. She's a gym rat, always gives 100%. Well, Courtney Casey's really strong, and she's only lost to elite fighters. I feel like maybe Felice Herrig's win over undefeated Alexa Grasso, who I think we'd all agree was a little overrated at this point, has tilted the line a little too much in her favor. I think the value's probably with Courtney Casey in a fight that should be a pick 'em. Look, if a fight's a pick 'em, you think's a pick 'em, and one fighter's plus 150, you should always take it. That's the case here. I'm betting Courtney Casey as well. Uh, best of luck to everyone this weekend, UFC 218, Bellator 189. Uh, best of luck to Bonner in, in Madison Square Garden in New York. Chris Camozzi, you're going down, brother. <laughs> See you guys next week. Best of luck. Take care.